Hollywood, California, Monday, March 15th. The Lux Radio Theater, starring Marlena Dietrich with Herbert Marshall in Desire, featuring Otto Kruger and Zeffie Tilbury. Lux presents Hollywood, bringing you Marlena Dietrich, Herbert Marshall, Otto Kruger, and Zeffie Tilbury. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our guests, Mr. Ernst Lubitsch, Distinguished Motion Picture Director, and Miss Kay Roberta Williams, hostess of Hollywood's famous specialty shop, I, Magnin and Company. Our conductor, Louis Silver. From our theater on Hollywood Boulevard, the makers of Lux Flakes bid you a hearty welcome to the 124th performance of the Lux Radio Theater. Before we hear Marlena Dietrich and Herbert Marshall in Desire, a few words about our product, Lux Flakes. We've been interested lately in hearing how many women use Lux in the dishpan because they consider it a beauty treatment for their hands. Lux Flakes are so gentle, and they make dishwashing easier, too. One woman, Mrs. Travis Johnson of New York, writes, Nice hands mean a lot to me. I'm a pianist, so I can't afford to let my hands get rough and red. Using Lux for the dishes is the most inexpensive beauty care I know. My husband agrees with me, too. Says my hands look as nice as when we were married. And a husband's compliment means something. As Mrs. Johnson points out, Lux flakes for dishes are inexpensive. It costs less than one cent a day to keep your hands nice this way. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Marlena Dietrich is a Hollywood rarity. Her success story is the only one of its kind I know. You've heard of our screen Cinderella's, the girls who had to go on the stage to make a living or to support a destitute family. But it was love of acting alone that brought Marlena first to the theaters of Berlin and Vienna and inevitably to Hollywood. It was Max Reinhardt who gave Miss Dietrich her first chance on the stage and thereby launched one of the most glittering careers of our time. Recently, in Vienna and London, thousands jammed the squares in front of her hotel, cheering her wildly. To protect her from the crowd's enthusiasm, London's heroic bobbies worked overtime. When Miss Dietrich left, it was remarked by a great London newspaper that, although we, her devoted slaves, regret her departure, it is said that Scotland Yard detectives are toasting it in nightclubs and looking forward to a long holiday. Police, the paper went on to say, are anticipating the threat of the coronation crowds as child's play. In our adaptation of the Paramount film Desire, she comes to us in the role she filled with such distinction on the screen, Madeleine de Beaupre. Making his fourth appearance on our stage, Herbert Marshall is heard as the English automobile engineer, Tom Bradley. Since his last appearance here, Mr. Marshall has been busy preparing with Miss Dietrich for the new Paramount film Angel. They had planned to shoot the first scenes of Angel today, but to make this broadcast possible, graciously postpone starting until tomorrow. Otto Kruger faces our microphone in the part of Carlos, one of the most polished actors of, of the stage and screen. Mr. Kruger has just starred with Mary Ellis abroad in Glamorous Night, produced by British International Pictures. Zephy Tilbury, who played the role of Aunt Olga in the film version, resumes it tonight. High in the flies of our stage... Columbia's engineer reaches for the dials of the control board, ready to release to the ends of the earth the Lux Radio Theater's presentation of Desire. And here come our players, Marlena Dietrich and Herbert Marshall with Otto Kruger and Zeffi Tilbury. Our scene is the Paris branch of the Bronson Automobile Factory. In the manager's elaborate office, a young man paces the floor angrily, talking to himself in loud, threatening tones. He's rehearsing a speech he's going to deliver to the boss. Turning suddenly, he leans across the manager's desk and points a menacing finger at the empty chair. Now look here, Mr. Gibson. You're only going to stop me, and no one else is going to stop me. I'm going on this vacation whether you like it or not. And if you want to throw me out, why don't you? What's that? Now why do you bring up arguments like that? Well, yes, I know you brought me over from Paris to London. But you didn't do it for my sake. You did it because you wanted a good engineer, Mr. Gibson, and I'd done my job. I've been designing Bronson Motors for the last three years, and I need a rest. No? 
Oh. Well, let me tell you this, Mr. Gibson. I'm not going back to London before I've had my vacation, and that's final. Right. Good morning, Tom. Oh, uh, morning, Mr. Gibson. Well, Tom, it's all right. You can have your vacation. I can have... Oh, well, thank you. Oh, you don't have to thank me. You've done a fine job. Everyone in London recognizes that. But they want you back home by the 15th at the latest. The 15th? That gives me two weeks. Where are you going? Italy. Oh, yes? That's where I've always wanted to go, ever since I was old enough to know about it. Milan, Florence, Livorno, Napoli. All those places I've read about and never had a chance to see. And I'll have two weeks, two whole weeks in Italy. Fine, fine. And to show you how much we appreciate your services, we are lending you a car for your trip. That's great. But we thought we might just as well utilize you for a little uh, publicity. You won't mind putting one of these signs in the car, will you? A sign? Well, I... Now, let's see. Which one is the best? I am delighted to drive a Bronson 8. Mm, no. I am glad to drive a Bronson 8. Hmm. It's difficult to decide. Must be quite a strain, Mr. Gibson. I am delighted. I am glad. Well, which do you like? Mm, personally, I prefer happy. 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 I'm happy to drive a Bronson 8. Why, that's splendid. Splendid. We have our slogan now. I'm happy to drive a Bronson 8. I'm delighted to drive a Bronson 8. I'm glad to drive a Bronson 8. I'm happy to drive a Bronson 8. Whoa! It's Mr. Brutti. Look at that mud fender. It's all right, old man. No damage done. No damage done, huh? No damage done. Look at that mud fender. It is bent in two. Well, so is mine. I'm perfectly willing to pay for it. If you do not know anything about cars, why do you drive? Sorry, I'm just a beginner. You should take lessons, then. Albert, come back here. But, madame. At once, please. There, you see. The lady wants you to get back into your car. Albert. Oh, I'm coming, madame. Sorry, Albert. Tell the lady it was my fault. Get in, Albert. Yes, madame. Now drive on. Yes, madame. I've told you 20 times not to pick walls, Albert. You do not have to address me as your footman now. There is no one listening. All the same, the advice is good. That Britisher is a fool. We don't stop to argue with fools. Not when we are carrying a string of pearls worth two million francs. Huh? You have the pearls with you? They are in the car? Yes. Why was I not told? I thought our plan was to mail them to Italy. Our plan is to take them to Italy. Oh, but it is dangerous. We may be stopped by the police. Not if you will drive slowly and carefully. So far as the jeweler knows, these pearls were purchased on credit by Madame Potquet. By the time he discovers I was not Madame Potquet, we'll be across the border into Italy. Where do we pick up Carlos and Olga? Carlos at the Hotel Milan. We meet Olga later at the villa. Oh, I do not like this. Carrying those pearls, it is too risky. Now, what if the police... Oh, there. Keep your eyes on the road. I'm driving, you say to go slow. When you are driving, it is something different, eh, Madeleine? We are safe here, and I'm driving carefully. What did that last sign read? Badonecchia, five kilometers. Badonecchia, that's the Italian border. We must be almost there. Yes. But you may not be so safe when the custom officers search your handbag. It's only the luggage they are interested in. Oh, you think so? Oh, well. Be careful, that man on the road. Hey! Hey! You almost hit that man. He shouldn't stand in the middle of the road taking pictures. Madeline, I just remember. You know who he was? That man back there on the road? Who? The Britisher. The one who bumped into us in Paris. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Oh, you do not see what happened? When you pass him, you drive through some mud puddle. He was covered up from head to foot with mud. <laughs> oh, that is very funny, no? We are coming into town. Please try to act like a chauffeur, Albert. Oh, yes, madame. Uh, where do we go now? To the customs office. You'll come with me. All my line to the right, signore. All luggage must be inspected. Ladies will open all handbags, please. A line to the right, signore. You hear, Madeline? They inspect everything today. All the women's luggage. Be quiet. What will you do with the pearls? Be quiet, I say. Officer. I'm looking for the owner of that white roadster outside. I'm sorry, signore, I do not know. Where is he? That's all I want to know. Where is he? Here, monsieur. Oh, 
Oh, you. <laughs> we meet again, mademoiselle. I'm sorry I splashed you with mud. It was unintentional. Oh, it's quite all right, really. It was silly of me to make a fuss about it. Well, you know how these things get you for a moment. Oh, of course. You're parking your luggage through the customs? Yes. Is this the line? I'm the last one. You may go before me if you wish. Oh, thanks, but I, I wouldn't want to... Oh, it's nothing. I'm not quite ready yet. Well, very well. Who is the next, please? Will you come this way, senor? Right with you. Thanks again, mademoiselle. Madeline, quick. Before they search your bag, we'd better go. It'll be all right now, Albert. But the pearls? The pearls are in the Englishman's pocket. What? I put them in his coat pocket when I spoke to him. Are you mad? Now, how are you going to get them back again? I'll get them back. I go on alone from here, Albert. I meet him on the road. You get in touch with Carlos by telephone. Tell him I see him at the Hotel Milan in two days. Entendu. I'm happy to drive a Bronson 8. I'm happy and glad and delighted. Delighted to drive... Whoa! Hello there. Oh, good afternoon, monsieur. What's the matter? Are you stuck? Yes. There's something wrong with my car. Oh. I'll have a look at it. Thank you. Let's see now. How did this happen? I bumped over a rock. Must have been an awfully big one. I'd swear that carburetor was hit with a monkey wrench. You can't fix it, monsieur. Not without spare parts. Well? What are you going to do? I'll just leave it here and send back for it tomorrow. Would you give me a lift? Why, of course. Delighted. Delighted, mademoiselle. I'll put your grips on my carrier. Thank you, monsieur. Aren't you a little cold, monsieur? Oh, not a bit, no. Why? Driving so long without your coat? Oh, don't worry about me. I'm all right. Where is it? What? Your coat. Oh, I, I put it back in my grip. Oh. Nice country, isn't it? Beautiful. You know, I'm glad you had that accident. Are you? Really glad. Do you think our luggage is safe back there on the carrier? Who cares? But Don't I... Don't you worry. I put yours on the bottom. If you hear anything fall, it's my suitcase. You have nothing to worry about. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. You know, I'm really lucky. If I hadn't found you, I'd still be standing there in the middle of the road instead of being on my way to Milan. Is that where we're going? We? Sure. I'll drive you there. I am lucky. <laughs> You're lucky. You mean I am. Having you with me. Thank you. You're very charming, you know. Or did you know? <laughs> very difficult question to answer. <laughs> you know what I wish would happen? That you would lose your suitcase. I would lose my suitcase. We would lose the car and be stranded here for ten days without a soul around us. I can't help it. That's my idea of a real vacation. <laughs> Look out there. That's Italy. The birds are singing, the sun is shining. And you are probably taking a cold. Does that really worry you? It does. Why? I'm just selfish. If you get a cold, I may get one too, being so close to you. You know it gets colder as it gets later. And I may have to move a little bit closer if I get chilly. I may even put my hands in your pocket. Oh, maybe I'd better get my coat. I wish you would. All right. With you in a minute. Hey! I say, wait! Where are you going? Come back here! Come back with that car! For the tenth time, Madeline. Where are those pearls? For the tenth time, Carlos, I don't know. You said he put the coat in his bag. He did. But when I drove away and got out to look for the grip, the grip wasn't there. He must have taken it off the carrier before I had a chance to get away. Then that man still has the pearls in his pocket? Yes. What did you do with his car? I wrecked it. Why? I couldn't drive a stolen car all through Italy. I drove it into a stream and came on by train. Hmm. But without the pearls. Madeline... You aren't by any chance double-crossing me. Don't be vulgar. Who was this man? An Englishman. Mm, that's a great help. What was his name? I don't know. Uh, Tom Bradley, I think. Oh, you think? Good. Uh, what did he look like? He was tall. Well, one more little clue like this, and we ought to have him in our hands. 
Any other distinguishing traits? Well, he seemed to be a man of very good taste. He likes me. Didn't I tell you never to mix love with business? Don't be absurd, Carlos. This man interests me about as much as you do. That should satisfy you. I want to tell you something, Madeline. I think I've always behaved as a gentleman. And I hope you continue to do so. That all depends. Hello. Yes. This is the Countess de Beaupre suite. Hmm? What? Oh. Well, there must be some mistake. You... Oh. Oh, I see. Who is it? Well, well, yes, of course. Very well. Yes, uh, ask Mr. Bradley to come up, please. Bradley? He's here at the hotel. Claims to have recognized you as the woman who stole his car. He's complained to the police. Oh, charming. And you invite him up to complete the description? We've got to see him. Don't forget, he has the pearls. Now, uh, let's be calm. All we can get is five years. No, seven. I looked it up. A slip-up now would be fatal. Our stories have got to match. Now, let's go through it again quickly. Who am I? You are my uncle, Prince Schallenberg. How did I get the bullet hole in my wrist? In ribs? the battle on the Marne. Who was your mother? Grand Duchess Sandra, who went down with the Lusitania. Your father was the Grand Duke Sergei. Killed by the Bolsheviks. Ah. Good luck, Countess. Good luck, Your Highness. Come in. Good morning. Good morning. So it was you, Mademoiselle. What was the idea of taking my car and... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask what this is all about? Oh, this is my uncle, Prince Schallenberg. Bradley is my name. Are you by chance insinuating that my niece stole your car? Yes, I am. That's not true. Uncle, it is true. What? Yes, but let me explain. I don't want any excuses. This is the last of your numberless escapades. I'm going to bring this up at the family council, yes? But, uncle... Oh, you're not going to drag down the family name any longer. Do you realize what you did? You stole a car. I'll see that the family disowns now, you. Now, look, here, I wouldn't go too far. I must ask you to let me handle this alone. Whose niece is she, your niece or my niece? Well, whose car was it, your car or my car? Let me tell you, my niece is more important to me than your car. And my car is more important to me than... Well, perhaps not. <laughs> Thank you. Now, look, Your Highness, I'm on my vacation. I don't want any more trouble than I've had already. Just give me 10,000 francs for my car and we'll forget the whole thing. And you will cancel your complaint to the police? Of course. Mm. Young man, I think your attitude is splendid. I'll uh, write you a check at once. I want to thank you, monsieur. Oh, never mind that. But why, why did you do it? You want to hear the truth? Yes. I was very late for a luncheon appointment. I see. But after all, why did you have to leave me in the middle of the road? I would have been glad to drive you. You were going slower and slower. And you know yourself why. It's silly to say, but suddenly I got in a terrible panic. We were alone there. I didn't know you. And before I knew what I was doing, I stepped on the grass. I was really afraid. Of what? Of you. Oh, there was no reason for that. I paid you a few compliments. I told you how charming, how lovely you were. And I would still repeat it. But I didn't do anything. But you intended to. I did not. <laughs> you had it in your eye. <laughs> I, I didn't know it showed. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, did you make your lunch appointment? Yes, but after I got here, I didn't keep it. Would you keep a dinner engagement for tonight with me? With you? It may sound very strange, but I've never had dinner with a countess. And I'm afraid you never will. You're leaving today. So am I. Are you going to Florence, too? No. Neither am I. We are going to our villa down on the coast. If you would care to come as my guest. Oh, I say. Your check, monsieur. Oh, 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 thanks. Uncle, I have just invited Mr. Bradley to come with us to the villa. Splendid. Splendid. Mr. Bradley, we'd be delighted to have you. But I haven't much with me in the line of clothes. Oh, it'll be quite all right. Just bring the clothes you have now. The ones you had with you in the car. Oh, of course. Of course. Well, it's very kind of you. Not at all. I insist, Mr. Bradley. I insist. Yes, and so do I, monsieur. <laughs> In a moment, we'll continue with Desire, with Marlena Dietrich, Herbert Marshall, and Otto Kruger. But now, we take you to the Coconut Grove. It's tea time, and the room is filled with dancers. In the middle of the dance, a handsome couple return to their table, a frown on the girl's pretty face. What is the matter? Let's listen in. You know, Tom, I'm so embarrassed, dancing with this hideous run in my stocking. You poor girl. You sure have all the tough luck. 
Didn't you get a run in your stocking the last time I took you out? Yes, and I've about given up. I've tried all kinds of stockings, but I still have rotten luck with runs. Oh, here comes Bella. Tom, why all the gloom? Oh, Sue's popped another run, and it started to unravel her disposition. Oh, is that all? Why don't you join the Cut Down on Runs Club, Sue? No dues, no initiation fee, just... just what? Oh, just toss your stockings and luck flake studs after every wearing. I've cut way down on runs this way. Honest? Sure thing, you know. Hmm, maybe Lux is the answer to this maiden's prayer, too. Clever girls do cut down on runs by using Lux flakes. Lux flakes are especially made to save the elasticity of the silk. It's when a stocking has lost elasticity that the threads tend to snap and runs start whenever there's a strain. So to avoid the nuisance and expense of constant runs, protect your stockings with gentle Lux flakes. You'll be surprised at how much longer your hosiery will wear. Once again, Mr. DeMille. Marlena Dietrich, Herbert Marshall, and Otto Kruger continue in Desire. It's evening of the following day. In the living room of a beautifully furnished villa on the coast, Madeline sits by a shortwave radio, waiting for the international news report. She seems amazingly self-contained in view of the fact that Bradley still has the pearls in the pocket of his coat. The news announcer interrupts the music. You will now hear the news of the day from the capitals of the world. Paris, France. The most sensational jewel robbery of a decade. The disappearance of a two million franc string of pearls from Duval and Company, the famous jewelers, still goes unsolved. Madeline, turn that thing off. Police reports from other capitals. Well, Carlos? I just came in from Bradley's room. He's dressing for dinner? Yes. What color was his coat? The one with the pearls? Dark brown. Confound it, that's the one he's going to wear. How do you know? He has no dinner jacket with him. The brown coat was lying across the bed. You don't think he has found the jewels? I don't think so, no, but we've got to be careful. Mm, Madeline, have you any kind of a pearl necklace? Yes, the imitation I bought in Vienna. Put it on. Wear it at dinner. Why? Never mind. Now, uh, one thing more. In which pocket of the coat did you slip the necklace? The left-hand pocket. Good. After dinner, I may work a little magic... Well done. Splendid. You play beautifully, Countess. Now you do something, Mr. Bradley. Well, I, I can walk on my hands. No, please. It's too early after dinner. Uncle, why don't you show us some card tricks? <laughs> oh, no, no. Yes, yes, why don't you? Oh, uh, all right. Uh, by the way, uh, what's that on your nose? Hmm? Ah, there we are. Silver coin. See? Oh, good. Do you always carry money in your nose? I don't know, but I often pay through it. <laughs> you know any more? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Madeline... Uh, may I have your pearls for a moment? Of course. Here. Yeah, thank you, dear. Uh, you see these pearls? Uh, now watch. One, two, three. Presto. They're gone. Splendid. Where are they? Will you kindly look in the left-hand pocket of your coat? Well. Huh. Well, how did they get in there? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you that, Mr. Bradley. Here are your pearls, Countess. Thank you so much. Ah, well, I uh, hope you've been entertained. Entertained? It's been a marvelous evening. You know, Mr. Bradley, you've had a very strenuous day, and I should think that you would be tired. Tired? Oh, no, no, really. I could stay up a week under these conditions. But, um, but you're looking tired, Your Highness. And it is rather late. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, then, I'll do my final trick of the evening. Make myself disappear. Good night. Good night. Good night. I think I will say good night, too. Oh, no, no, not yet. It's early. Didn't you just say yourself that it's late? Late for uncles. Early for nieces. You look very beautiful sitting there. Don't spoil the picture. All you need is a frame, and it would be a masterpiece. No, you don't even need a frame. All I need is a nice, soft bed. Tell me... Why did you really invite me to come here? 
My uncle thought it would be a nice gesture. Oh, your uncle. He is your uncle, isn't he? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. You see, I have uncles too, but they're different. My uncles are more like uncles. You're getting impertinent. I didn't mean it, but I'm sorry. Please don't be. It's nothing. Thanks. You must realize I've never met anyone quite like you before. You're so new to me, so different. I wish I could make you understand. You do understand, don't you? Countess? Countess, are you asleep? I'm crazy about you. Madeline. Madeline. You don't know how I've wanted to call you that. Madeline. I love you. It's hit me all of a sudden. I love you. When you wake up, I'm going to take you in my arms and kiss you. I'm going to tell you, Madeline. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I was asleep. Did you say something? Oh, no, no, nothing. Then you'll excuse me, please. I'm so very tired. Going for school? You're still up? What are you doing out here? I couldn't sleep. Nervous. Why should you be nervous? I don't know. I, I didn't know I had a nerve in my body till tonight. Why don't you go to bed and get a good rest? I try to, but that moon. You see him there? Very strong, isn't he? He was shining right into my window. Why don't you draw the curtain? Oh, I see. Turn off the moon, turn on the moon, just as you like it. Some people can do that more easily than others. I understand. Aren't you a bit hasty, Mr. Bradley? Maybe I am. I'm sorry. You see... Oh, you wouldn't understand. How could you? I've only a few more days and then back to prison. This is the first vacation I've ever had in my life. A few days and I'll have to be back in London and all the fun is over. Getting up at six o'clock and working way into the night... Yet I couldn't live without it. I love it, and I hate it. You know, Mr. Bradley, the moon is very becoming to you. I never saw you in this light before. You weren't even listening. Oh, yes, I was. I heard everything you said about yourself, London, your work. You love it, and you hate it. Isn't that the way you feel about me? Not exactly. I never said I love you. <laughs> Liar. When? <laughs> Maybe I dreamed when I was asleep. Yes, I must have dreamed. Because I heard you say, Madeline, I love you. When you wake up, I'm going to take you in my arms and kiss you. You didn't keep your word. Madeline, so you weren't asleep. Not quite. Then why did you let me go through all this torture? Why didn't you tell me? I wasn't sure if I liked you enough. And now? I still don't know. But I think yes. Madeline. 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 Are you awake? Madeline. Oh, good Lord, Madeline, wake up. Yes, darling. What? Listen, I've had a wire from Florence this morning. I have to leave immediately. I'm going to take this Bradley with me. What did you say? I said I'm going to take this Bradley into town with me. I'll get rid of him there. Oh, and the pearls. I have them. Goodbye, Madeline. Wait, Carlos. I can't. I've got to wake up Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Bradley. Wake up, Mr. Bradley. Yes, darling. What? Oh. Well, wake up, please. I'm leaving for Florence. Oh, goodbye. Have a good trip. If you'd like to go with me, I'll be only too glad to have you. It's a wonderful trip. You can see Italy. I can see what? Italy. I've wanted to see Italy since I was a little boy. Well, 
now's your chance. But I'm not a little boy anymore. Uh... Darling, I tell you, you're wrong. Darling, I'm right. Darling, you're beautiful, but you're stubborn. Do you know this is the first disagreement we've had? All right, let's find out. We'll ask the cook. Giuseppe, Giuseppe. Yes, senor. What day is today, Thursday or Friday? Saturday, senor. Saturday. A whole week gone like an hour. Seven days. Seven dreams. Adding up to one dream. Do you remember the first day here, Monday? Oh, do I. And then came Tuesday. And what about Wednesday? What did we talk about? Did we talk? Mm, certainly. About what? Mm, nothing. Well, let's change the subject. Now I'm going to tell you something really interesting, all about London, all about my work. I wish you would. I didn't really mean it. I wouldn't bore you that way. I'd like to see you at work. I can picture you in overalls, really working. And with dirty hands. See, there's no glamour about me. I'm not a king, nor a prince, nor a count. Just an ordinary citizen. Very ordinary. A 20 pounds a week man. That's a lot of money for me. What's the matter? It's Saturday. Our dream is almost over. When must you go? Monday. Must you? Yes. Don't let's talk about it. Let's hope something will happen. Something must happen. I can't leave you. The idea of not seeing you Stop anymore. It, darling. I can't even think of it. Countess, pardon me. Yes, Giuseppe. Your Aunt Olga has arrived. Oh. Where is she? In the house, Countess. You'll excuse me, Tom. Of course. I won't be long. Don't be, please. Olga. Hello, Madeline. Why did you come? Mm. That's a fine way to greet a sweet old lady. Why don't you bust me in the nose? What do you want? You shouldn't talk to me that way. If your grandmother came here, what would you do? Why, you'd offer her a brandy, of course. Straight? Please. Brand is the only thing I am straight about. Did Carlos send you? Yes, and he's pretty sore at you. I don't care. Now, come on, now. You could have answered his wires. They really need you in Florence. There's a great chance of selling the necklace. We found a sucker. As a sucker of the century. He's a big umbrella manufacturer. So we thought we'd put a little sunshine in his life and introduce you to him. I'm afraid you'll have to find someone else. I'm not going. Not going? No, I'm through with you and Carlos and all the others. Really? Carlos, why didn't you stay in the car? You promised to let me handle her. I'll do it myself. Madeline, before I tell you what I plan to do with you, in case you refuse, I want to compliment you. You look more beautiful than ever. Love must be a wonderful thing. It is, Carlos. It gives one strength and courage. Something to fight for. I have something to fight for, too. Now go and pack, Madeline. We're leaving. Yes, but in different directions. No, no, in the same direction. Come back here. Let me go. Oh, no. Let me go. Why don't you call for help? Why don't you call your friend? He's right outside. Why don't you bring him here? Why don't you tell him what you are? Or perhaps you'd prefer that I tell no. him. That would hurt, wouldn't it? Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, think it over, Madeline. Think it over carefully. Sit down, Madeline. Here, dear. Why can't he let me alone? Why can't he give me my chance for happiness? It's really serious, isn't it, between you and this Bradley fellow? For the first time in my life. Please. Don't... He must be a nice young man. Where is he? I'd like to meet Don't him. Don't you dare. If anyone is to tell him, I'll do it myself. Oh, no, you won't. You think you will, but you won't. I tried it once myself, and it won't do, my dear. What difference does it make? I love him, and he loves me. That's just the point, and it won't do, believe me. Please go away. Leave me alone. Some years ago, I was sick in a hospital in Vienna. There was a charming doctor. He was a fine man. We thought a great deal of each other. And I used to dream as you are dreaming now. And then right in my dreams, 
I feel a hand falling on my shoulder. Sooner or later, it falls. Sooner or later. And I used to hear myself saying to him, I must go downtown on important business. I'll be back soon. And then under my breath, I'd say, soon. Ten years. Twenty years. Life. I dream of him now and then. I didn't spoil it. Well, what are you going to tell him? I don't know. I'll find something. Madeline! Oh, Tom, come here. I have something to tell you. Wait until you hear what I have to tell you. Do you know what this is? Tom. It's a piece of paper, that's what you think. But it isn't. It's King Solomon's Mines and Captain Kidd's treasure. It's a gusher of oil, that's what it is. Please listen to me, Tom. Look here. You see these two lines? These two little lines? Yes. Well, I spent years looking for them. I've told you about my new carburetor. I had ideas for it, good ones. Everybody liked them. But there was one little thing to make it practical, and I couldn't find it. And now I've got it. These two tiny little lines make all the difference in the world to the carburetor. And maybe to me. And to you. What do you say? I'm so happy you found it. Now you are a real inventor. And you will be a great man. I don't care about that. You'll be famous. And happy. Is it a go, darling? Will you marry me? It would be wonderful. It would be. It will. It can't be. Madeline, what is it? I have to tell you something. Well, what is it? I don't know how to say it. I should have told you before. Tom, I'm married. Married? That's impossible. It's true, Tom. It can't be. It is. I don't know what to say. I, I can't believe it. A few minutes ago, you were telling me... I just me... talked to my aunt. She has nothing to do with us. She has, Tom. She brought me down to earth. She made me see reality. Reality? But we love each other. That's reality. No, Tom, it's a dream. And I'm afraid it'll have to remain one. You mean we have to separate? Never see each other again? Believe me, Tom, it's best for you and best for me. But let's be grateful. We had a gorgeous week together. Seven heavenly days. Seven dreams. A beautiful adventure. Adventure? I see... Well, that's what I was looking for when I started out. And I got it. A beautiful adventure. Turn on the moon. Turn off the moon. All right. We'll turn it off. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles. Marlena Dietrich, Herbert Marshall, and our all-star cast come back to us shortly in Desire. Years ago, when my friend D.W. Griffith and I were fighting it out on a Hollywood battlefront in an effort to raise motion pictures from a novelty to an art, we suddenly realized that a young man was emerging in Europe who might easily steal the prize for which we were struggling. It occurred to Adolf Zucker and Jesse Lasky that the best way to avoid the competition of Ernst Lubitsch was to get him on our side. At the time, too many things stood in the way. But today, I'm proud and thankful that Mr. Lubitsch is one of my colleagues at Paramount Studios. Starting as a comedian, character actor, and stage player, Ernst is now certainly one of the most brilliant directors in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lubitsch. It's not only a pleasure to be here at CB, it's also very helpful. While I produced the film version of Desire with Miss Dietrich, I never had the good fortune to direct her. But since tomorrow morning, I start directing a new picture called Angel with Miss Dietrich and Mr. Marshall. I naturally have been watching their performance very closely. I'd be very happy if I can turn out as fine a production 
as you are presenting tonight and as you do every Monday night at the Lux Radio Theater. And thank you, Hans. For several years, you with Paula Negri and I with Gloria Swanson were trying to outdo each other. This time, at least, we're working with the same charming stars. I'm interested to see the result of the famous Lubitsch touch. So am I. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the delicious humor. It's the inimitable touch of Lubitsch genius. It's what Phidias gave to a statue, what Rackham gives to painting, what Victor Herbert gave to his music, what Balzac gave to literature. Hmm, who can define it? It's just the Lubitsch touch. Well, I'm afraid if I ever become conscious of it, I would lose what you call the Lubitsch touch. <laughs> and what's your definition of a good director? Well, uh, uh, you and I and few others. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice, but seriously, what is a good director? A good director is a man who can execute successfully what other people have written for him. But a great director is a man who helps in the creation of the story and tells it in his own unique style, putting his own personality into the telling of that story on the screen. Well, tell us what procedure you follow in directing a film. Well, I understand that we both use the same methods. I never start shooting until I've worked out every detail at my desk. I believe that the story is all important, and like you, I write with the writers. This business of solving anticipated problems takes much more time than actual shooting of the picture. On the set, I try to encourage the cast at all times. The stage actor has the benefit of audience reaction. In pictures, he has only the director to look to. I have found that the more encouragement I give the players, the better they perform. Well, I know it's a rule with you never to disclose the story of a new picture. Will you make an exception tonight? Yes, uh, to this extent. Miss Dietrich will play the part of a modern married woman, known as Angel. Whether or not this is a misnomer, you have to decide for yourselves when you see it. Mr. Marshall is a British statesman, and our scene will be Paris and London. Melvin Douglas, Edward Everett Horton, Herbert Munden... And Ernest Cossart will also have prominent parts. I enjoyed producing pictures tremendously, but I'm delighted to return to directing. After all, the thrill is not alone in conceiving ideas, but in having the director's opportunity to interpret and follow them through. My thanks to you all. My thanks to you. He gets things in a picture nobody else can get. Back to Marlena Dietrich with Herbert Marshall in Desire, featuring Otto Kruger. It's late the same afternoon. As the daylight fades into evening, Tom comes from the house and walks quickly toward the road. As he reaches the outer gate of the villa, Madeline comes to meet him. Tom, wait. Well? Aren't you going to say goodbye to me? Of course. Where are those pearls now? We are going to give them back. Please, Tom, I beg you, don't get into this. Where are those pearls? Madeline. Shh. Madeline, where are you? Oh. Good evening, Your Highness. You know, I almost left without saying goodbye. Really? Well, goodbye. Oh, but there's no need for it now. No, I'm not leaving. What? I'm invited, Mr. Bradley, to stay for dinner. Oh, indeed. But I'm afraid you'll miss your train, Mr. Bradley. Now, that's the kind of hospitality I like. Mr. Bradley, the truth is, I'm sure you'll understand... We have some very serious family problems to discuss. Oh, that's all right. Don't think of it. Just consider me one of the family. Shall we go into the house? Uncle Carlos? Some more chicken, Uncle Carlos? No. Aunt Olga? No, thank you. Mr. Bradley? Thank you. It's delicious. You know... This is a sort of farewell dinner, and I really think we ought to have a toast. Uh, what would you suggest? Well, I want to drink first to my hostess, who first stole my car and then stole my heart. My car was insured, and my heart wasn't. Then I think we ought to drink to Aunt Olga, because I understand she's been ill. I? Yes. I heard you were very ill. About 35 years ago, in Vienna. Oh, I see... You made a mistake, Aunt Olga. You should have told that doctor. If he had really loved you, he would have helped you over that wall. Oh, why, I... Uh, how about some cranberry sauce? It goes very well with a fricassee of chicken. 
Uncle Carlos? No, thank you. Tell me, Your Highness, you're a man of great experience. You usually know what's coming next. Do you think there's going to be a war? Hmm. I hope not. I'm always in favor of peace, but as the situation is at the moment, with nobody minding his own business, you never can tell what will happen. How about some more cranberry sauce, Aunt Olga? A, a little, please. You know, Your Highness, I was just thinking of some powder trips, tricks you once showed me. They were awfully good, but I think I can show you one the tops any you've ever seen. Now, you'll see this chicken on my fork. Now watch. One, two, three. Presto. It's gone, isn't it? Where is it? In my stomach. That's what you think. But it isn't. It's in the inside pocket of your coat. And it isn't chicken anymore. It's changed into a string of pearls. That's marvelous. I can hardly believe it. Now, let me see. Yes, you're right. It's in my inside pocket. But it didn't change into pearls. It changed into a revolver. Carlos, put it down. You see, Mr. Bradley, it's a better trick than you even thought. Carlos, don't. Now, Mr. Bradley, I'm going to lock you up in a nice cool cellar for two or three days where you'll have a chance to think about life and Brunson eights. In other words, I'm giving you back to the automobile business. Those are your plans, Uncle Carlos? Exactly. But suppose I should upset them. Mm. All the table. Ah, you you drop that gun. Oh, drop it. Oh, Pick it up, Madeline. I have it. Good. Sorry I had to twist your arm like that, Uncle Carlos. Mm -hmm. Now, you can do one more thing for me. You can give me that pearl necklace. Really? Please, Carlos, we must have it. Our whole happiness depends on it. You dirty double-crosser. Well, you won't get it. No? Then I'll have to do my final trick of the evening. You see this hand? Now it's a fist. The fist is still in my hand. When I count three, that fist will be on your jaw. One, two... Wait! One moment. Uh, suppose we talk this over. Splendid. Shall we sit down? to drive a Bronson 8. We're happy to drive... Tom, this isn't a Bronson 8. What's the difference? We're happy anyway. Have you got the pearls? My purse. What was the jeweler's name? Monsieur Duval. Monsieur Duval. Oh, Tom, do you think he'll take them back? Definitely. Yes, but uh, will he let me go? We're happy to drive a Bronson 8. We're delighted to drive a Bronson 8. We're glad to drive a Bronson 8. Monsieur Duval. Yes, Antoine? There's a lady here to see you, and a gentleman. Show them in, then. But the lady, she is the one who stole our pearls. What? Oui, Monsieur Duval. Quick, show them in. Then go call the police. Oui, Monsieur. Will you, uh, will you come this way, please? Thank you. How do you do, Monsieur Duval? How do you do? May I introduce my fiancé, Monsieur Bradley? Glad to meet you, Monsieur Duval. I've heard so much about you, it's... <laughs> Just like meeting an old friend. We came to see you about the pearl necklace. Pearl necklace? Do you intend to buy another one? On the contrary. You see, the pearl necklace which you sold, mademoiselle, is really beautiful, but it, oh, it's too expensive for us. I'm afraid we'll have to return it. You have it with you, dear? Yes, darling. Monsieur Duval, would it upset you very much if I asked you to take it back? Well, I... I hate to return things. It's not my habit. But I've changed my mind. As a matter of fact, I've changed my life. I'm marrying Mr. Bradley this afternoon. That is, I hope I am. Here are your pearls, monsieur. The pearls? You... You give them back to me? Monsieur Duval, I know my fiancé is indebted to you, and even to France. And if you could see any way to help us, to release Mademoiselle from her obligations would be very wonderful. Otherwise, we'll have to postpone our marriage for a long time, I'm afraid. Seven years. Seven long years, Monsieur Duval. You are very much in love. Very much, Monsieur. Mm. Monsieur Duval, Monsieur Duval, the police, they are here. Police? One moment, please. Antoine. Monsieur? Tell the police there has been a mistake. The pearls were not stolen. Oh, Monsieur. Tell them, Antoine. Oh, well, Monsieur. Our oh, thanks, Monsieur Duval. It is nothing. The pearls were, shall we say, 
temporarily mislaid. There will be no complaint. I think you may safely buy your tickets for England now. We will. And be assured, Monsieur Duval, that when I'm in England, I'll recommend you to all my friends. Oh, please don't. <laughs> Just as you like. Goodbye, Monsieur Duval. Goodbye, Monsieur. And thank you. Goodbye and bon voyage. Oh, Tom, I'm free. Darling, turn on the moon. Turn on the moon. For good, Madeline. Forever, darling. A little later, we'll hear more from tonight's stars. But now we drop the curtain on our play, hoping that every desire may be as pleasantly fulfilled. It's not news when dogs bite men, or when actresses come to Hollywood to go on the screen. But the story's different when an actress comes here to stop acting. Formerly in the Ziegfeld Follies, musical comedy and stock companies, Miss Kay Roberta Williamson journeyed to the film capital to become hostess of the Hollywood link of specialty shops operated by I. Magnum and Company. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Williamson. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Whenever the stars come to Magnum's and Droves, we know that some party or social event is about to take place. Any number of evening gowns, wraps and furs are purchased for the recent ball of the Los Angeles Turf Club, winding up the season at the Santa Anita track. The other day, Ginger Rogers gave a big roller skating party, which meant that we were busy from morning till night, fitting the stars in play suits, shorts, and little jackets. When the stars come to I, Magnum and Company, I know they have splendid collections to choose from. Suppose you tell us who buys what. The policy of our store doesn't permit that, Mr. DeMille. But you may be interested to know that your daughter Catherine just bought a bathing suit from us. Yes, it interests me considerably, Miss Williamson. I just received the bill. <laughs> Anyone who wants to get an idea of what the stars like in clothes can find out right here in the Lux Radio Theater. It's been my good fortune to see many of your broadcasts. And in doing so, I've also seen a real Hollywood fashion parade. Tonight, for instance, there's Marlana Dietrich, proving that a tailored suit can be decidedly feminine. She is wearing a black tailored gabardine suit with a white Georgette blouse. On her recent appearance here, Jean Arthur chose a crepe dress as Vivid Hunter's Green. Her woolen hat was a variation of the Cossack toque, while her fitted coat, made of the same fabric, was worn with a pair of cross foxes. Jean Harlow also wore crepe. Her short sleeve, simple black dress was trimmed only with rows of narrow black silk fringe. She wore a halo off the face hat, no veil, and black suede opera pumps. Of course, we all can't have as extensive wardrobes as picture stars, nor do our needs demand them. But we'd all do well to take care of our washables the Hollywood way, which is just another way of saying, with Lux Flakes. Now, my experience has been that by using Lux Flakes, I can keep clothes looking like new, just about twice as long. By that, I mean dainty, fresh-looking, and appealing. Lux protects colors wonderfully, and for silk stockings, there's nothing better. There's something about Lux Flakes that preserves the elasticity of silk thread. This enables them to give under strain, instead of developing runs so often, and makes them last ever so much longer. My recommendation is based on experience. The same experience that finds the wardrobe departments of all the leading Hollywood studios using Lux Flakes. Holidays and birthdays bring the leading gentlemen of the screen to our store for gifts. Herbert Marshall and Otto Kruger, Gary Cooper, and Mr. DeMille are favorites of the sales girls. Typical of Hollywood, they're very discriminating and know exactly what they want. Thank you again, and good night. It's a pleasure to have such a charming hostess for a guest. And now, a bit of dialogue in Demitas from our celebrated players, Mr. Herbert Marshall, Mr. Otto Kruger. Many thanks, C.B. Though it's a little late for a welcome home, Otto, I'd like to say that it's nice to see you back in America. Thanks, Bart. It's great being back. When I arrived in Hollywood from England last week, I found my manager on the doorstep. Before I could take my hat off, he told me that Mr. DeMille and you and Miss Dietrich were waiting for me here to start rehearsing our play. Well, of course, I came. I didn't know even what play we were doing. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to know that. We've learned that any play in the Lux Radio Theater is bound to be a good play. Mm. It must have been something of a shock, Otto, to find that I'd cast you as a villain. <laughs> yes. Yes, rather agreeable shock, though. It, in spite of the fact that this was the first of more than 300 productions in which I didn't get the girl. Mm -hmm. But it's always a pleasure to lose to Bart. <laughs> <laughs> You've nothing on me, Otto. Mr. DeMille gave me a new role recently when he asked me to guide this broadcast while he was roaming the Louisiana swamplands, 
seeking material for his new film, The Buccaneer. Hmm. How did you like playing producer? I was never so terrified in my life. I would much rather have faced the buccaneer than to have played the role of Herbert Marshall trying to be Cecil DeMille. Did you hear me, C.B.? Yes. I managed to reach a tiny store down there among the bayous in one of the most isolated sections of the United States. The owner had a radio, and I took possession of it immediately. Strange, though, you know. Every time you came on, something seemed to go wrong with the set. There was a peculiar noise, like a thumping on a door. That wasn't the set, C.B. That was my heart. <laughs> well, you sounded great, Bart. And I must say, I was particularly impressed when a grizzled shrimp fisherman, not knowing who I was, turned to a friend and remarked, hmm, that's the mill. He's getting better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all I can say to that is my gratitude to you out there who bore with me. My gratitude, and once again, a reluctant au revoir. To which I can only add a very sincere ditto. Well, thank you both. And now, Marlena... A word from you. Not one, but five. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Miss Dietrich, Mr. Marshall, and Mr. Kruger. This is your announcer, ladies and gentlemen, Melvin Wood. Word of next week's presentation comes to us shortly from Mr. DeMille. Miss Dietrich, Mr. Lubitsch, and Mr. DeMille appeared through courtesy of Paramount Studios. Mr. Marshall, RKO, and Columbia Studios, and Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Seventh Heaven. And now, Mr. DeMille. Next Monday night, in the Lux Radio Theater, good fortune finds me host to one of Hollywood's most charming and accomplished couples, Frederick March and his lovely wife, Florence Eldridge. Our play is one whose record on the stage and in motion pictures stamps it as one of the most successful stories in modern times. We will hear Mr. March in the same role he played on the screen, Prince Serke and Miss Eldridge as Grazia in the remarkable romantic fantasy, Death Takes a Holiday. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in Death Takes a Holiday. This is Cecil B. DeMille... Saying good night to you from Hollywood. Assisting our stars tonight were Georges Renavon as Albert, Ward Lane as Mr. Gibson, Ferdinand Munier as Mr. Duval, Victor Rodman as Antoine, Leo McCabe as radio announcer, Lou Merrill as Giuseppe, and Frank Nelson as customs officer. Before saying good night, may I say we were honored this evening by a most distinguished audience, including Mr. Frederick March, his celebrated wife, Florence Eldridge, and Miss Kay Johnson. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.